And here we go. Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss Master Data Management, Aligning Data Process and Governance, sponsored today by Datastax. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and with each other throughout the webinar. So to do so, just click the chat icon in the bottom middle of the screen to activate that feature. And if you'd like to continue the conversation after the webinar or follow Donna further, you may do so at community.dataversity.net. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and the recording of the session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me turn it over to David from Datastax for a word from our sponsor. David, hello and welcome. Well, hello there, Shannon. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you guys for letting me come in and chat. I am David jones Gilardi, a developer advocate at Datastax. And um, pretty much what I'm really going to get into is just kind of talking about how uh, our advanced data workloads, you know, they have really gained a lot in complexity these days and how you can simplify them with a NoSQL platform. Um, and a NoSQL platform today that I'm referring to is Apache Cassandra. So for those of you who are not familiar with Apache Cassandra, there are some really main items uh, that really kind of come up. You see them there in bold on the screen, that 100% uptime, zero lock-in, and global scale. So from the 100% uptime standpoint, some of you might kind of raise an eyebrow, be like, dude, how exactly can you claim that? And, and here's where this really comes from. So Cassandra is a distributed database, right? So it's made up of multiple nodes or instances. It's not a single instance. And that is a masterless and peer-to-peer -peer architecture. So what that translates into is any node can do what any other node does. And I can actually lose a majority of my nodes, data centers, all sorts of things, and the database is still up and available to serve requests. So that's what we mean by 100% uptime. It also scales linearly. So if you want to, say, double your throughput or double your capacity, you just double your nodes. And these can be databases on the size of a handful of nodes to 100,000 nodes, right? And we've seen this proven out time and time again um, over, uh, over the last decade or so that Cassandra has been around. Now, from the zero lock-in standpoint, really what this comes down to is Cassandra is deployment agnostic. It just doesn't care where you put it. That could be on-prem, that could be in a cloud provider, AWS, GCP, Azure, whatever, right? Um, and so you're not locked into any particular vendor with, with Cassandra. And then from the scalability standpoint, from the global scale standpoint, separate from the, the scale, the linear scalability piece that I was talking about there a moment ago, um, Cassandra allows you, if you want a single database, it's a would span the globe where you can have uh, data centers that are in multiple geographic locations to put your data close to where your, your users are, you can do that. And you can do that as a single database, right? So you could have one global database that can scale with you. Now, if you look at data diversity today, right, and the amount of things that we have to contend with, there is actually a significant amount of complexity that exists. And if you just, we'll just step through these items here. So if you take legacy data integration, whether it, let's say you have a mainframe system, or you have some project that got grandfathered in, or an example that I actually like, I used to work in defense, and uh, there was a particular orbital mechanics platform that was implemented in Pascal. It was uh, a very solid uh, platform, very efficient, Nobody really wanted to change it, and so it just stayed that way. And we had to deal with integrating with it, right? Uh, or it could be real-time stream events, like whether that be, say, IoT streams, uh, event log data, all sorts of things like that coming in. Then anybody today, uh, I know for every organization I've worked at over the last 20-something years, the disparate silo data thing is just a reality, whether that's through uh, mergers and acquisitions, whether it's different teams with different requirements and different databases that are spread around an organization. And each one of those silos has value on its own, but they have a lot more value if you can actually bring that data together. Then from the data security and sovereignty standpoint, Anybody who's worked, um, especially, say, in, in the EMEA market with GDPR, right, uh, this is something, this is another complexity that we have to deal with on a regular basis uh, because those security requirements may be different in different regions of the world, again, just adding to that complexity. And then from the scalability standpoint, um, people in the retail world for something like 
Black Friday, they have to deal with unpredictable scale all the time. I mean, this can literally make or break a business, right? So that's yet another piece. And then lastly there uh, is the hybrid multi-cloud piece. I kind of touched on this in the slide ago um, where, you, you know, having systems now that can not only exist, the data is on on-prem, it's on different cloud providers, and all of this comes together to really increase the complexity that we have to deal with. That also then translates into more workload complexity. And the reason why that is, is because over the last so many decades, our data management has really evolved. It, it, you know, if you look at how we started with things, with you know, traditional relational databases, a lot of times we were working with tabular formats. And then over time that has evolved, where now, especially after the NoSQL revolution, where more, you know, more capabilities started to kind of come into the world to say, go past some of the extents that we had with relational databases. Take a document store, for example. Um, can I store a document in a relational database? Totally, right? Uh, what happens though if the document is big enough and I blow out the number of characters I have in my Varkar field or something, not to split it up? Can I search through that document in a, in a relational database? Totally, but am I gonna get the same kind of efficient search that I might get if I have like a pure document store. And there was all sorts of technologies that kind of came out in the NoSQL revolution. Graph databases are another example of this. Well, what that translates into is with these new tech stacks and these new technologies came different ways of actually getting to the data and stuff where you get these mixed workloads. So then how do you solve for mixed workloads? It really comes down to two things. How complex is your query or how fast do you need it? complexity and speed. So if we break this down just a little bit, um, now this is the part where I, I start kind of talking about the DataStax Enterprise piece. So if you're not aware of it already at DataStax, we're the company behind Apache Cassandra. And Apache Cassandra itself is open source. The DataStax Enterprise piece is now where we're starting to push into the commercial realm and expanding past what you can do with just basic Apache Cassandra. And what that includes are more workloads than just SQL and tabular and JSON and such. This is where we see search, analytics, and graph. So now this starts to provide a single system, a single operational data layer that can actually perform all of these different workloads, whether that is from a simple query to complex or things that are at the machine fast level to offline fast. And what this really does is open up a whole new set of use cases or opportunities. This is not uh, an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I'm just going to start with fraud. So most people can kind of relate with fraud detection. Um, imagine for a second, you know, I'm, I'm in Orlando and, you know, I'm, I'm making a credit card purchase at some store or something along the lines. Uh, and then all of a sudden at that same time, there's somebody out in Texas who's attempting to make uh, many thousands of dollar purchase for a bike. Uh, you know, on that same credit card. This actually happened to me. Uh, not only do you need that real-time anomaly detection, but there needs to be some kind of follow-up, right? You have to find out, okay, can I find the fraudster? Can I find the fraudster's network? Were there other illicit activities going on at that time, you know, that are related to this particular activity, something like that. And so this is where now having this mixed workload capability along, you know, one database, so not just SQL, but things like graph, analytics, search, advanced security, as I mentioned, uh, in the case of like GDPR, being able to kind of flip those switches, really comes into play to kind of give you a, a, a more holistic view on all of your data. And so with DataSex Enterprise, this really brings down, it simplifies the data complexity. So it takes all those mixed workloads and it brings this together into a single platform built on Apache Cassandra that can scale with you can handle the real-time intelligence and is something you can deploy in multi-DC and multi-platform, again, whether you're on premises or in multiple cloud providers in a single database. So, you know, and for the time that we have, obviously I can't do a deep dive on any one of these particular areas. Uh, so if you're interested in whether it's Apache Cassandra, things like graph, search, analytics capabilities, so on and so forth, if you go to academy.datastacks.com, everything there is free. Right? There is literally a month worth of video courses uh, that you can take, exercises, all sorts of stuff that you can go into at academy.datastacks.com. And also for those who might be interested in Datastacks Enterprise itself, you want to check it out. If you go to datastacks.com slash downloads, you not only can download Datastacks Enterprise, but for those of you who are using Docker or Kubernetes, if you uh, download the DSE desktop, the DSX desktop, you can use that to click button auto provision Datastacks Enterprise with 
all of the workloads I mentioned. So you've got you know, CQL, search, analytics, and graph, and examples and notebooks and stuff that you can actually load there on your laptop and experiment with. And with that, um, I appreciate the time today. Thank you very much. And I will pass it back over to Shannon. David, thank you so much for this great presentation and for the Data Stack sponsorship. And if you have questions for David about Data Stacks, or you can submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and David will be joining Donna at the end of the Q&A presentation today. And now let me introduce to you our speaker of the series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry ex expert of information management with over 20 years of experience helping organizations around the globe enrich their opportunity, business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, I will turn it over to Donna to get uh, that her session started. Hello and welcome. Thanks, Sharon. Shannon. Always a pleasure to do these, and thanks everyone who joined. Um, as was mentioned in the beginning, today's topic is master data management um, and how mastery it aligns with not only data, but perhaps more importantly, business process and data governance. So um, many of you join these on a monthly basis, and we appreciate that. Uh, if this is your first time joining us at Dataversity, the good news is that everything is on, uh, on demand, and that's often a question that uh, Shannon gets of, will this be available after the presentation? So yes, and as will the slides. Um, so the uh, email sent out, and you can catch any of these on the Dataversity website. And we hope you can join us next month where we'll talk about data governance. So I will talk about data governance on this call, um, but uh, I will be a little lighter than I may have been normally because we have a whole dedicated session next month on that. So data governance is integral to master data management. They will not succeed without each other, um, but we will have a whole session on that next month. So just keep that in mind if you feel that I was a bit light on governance on this session. It is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> so what is the topic today is master data, or MDM, as we like to abbreviate that to. So <clears throat> really the easy way of thinking of what MDM is, if this is new to you and that's why you're joining this, um, it's, a, it's a, your business critical data assets. Um, and getting that not only ac accurate, but comprehensive view. So things like the classic customers, products, vendors, et cetera. Um, and as I already sort of um, touched on, uh, is that yes, this can be complex and there's tremendous value for analytics and warehousing and real-time operations, um, but there's a bit of an art and a science to how you get that, not only the architectural piece, uh, but the business piece, which is arguably as if not more important. So again, if you've joined these webinars before, you may be familiar with this framework um, because you need to look holistically, especially with something like master data, which is so core to everything. So um, this is the framework we use in our practice at Global, Global Data Strategy. And again, it should be familiar. It's aligned loosely with the DMBOC, uh, the Data Management Body of Knowledge from DEMA. Um, and, but everything should start with a business strategy, especially master data. When you think of what master data is, it really should be how you describe your business, your customers, your products, et cetera. Um, and then how do you manage that through things like master data that require not only architecture and modeling that you'll see there to the right, data quality, metadata, um, but data governance, which is the people and the business process around making that right. So we'll touch on a lot of those, although the topic is the one in the box there, master data, they are absolutely linked with everything else. So again, you may be joining this webinar because Master Data is new to you, and thank you. This is hopefully going to be helpful for you. Um, I always, because we're data architects on the call, we love, or especially data modelers on the call, uh, love our definition. So let's start with, um, I, I chose Gartner's definition here of what is master data and then what is master data management. So master data is similar as I just mentioned. Uh, how they define it is the, this consistent and unique form of identifiers uh, that describe the core entities of the enterprise, customers, prospects, citizens, sites, uh, ch charts of account. I had to do my English major there. I got that quite wrong. But anyway, so <laughs> that should make sense, right? And that's something that uh, viscerally most people um, understand uh, when you describe the business people get because it's stuff they're using every single day. Um, master data management obviously is the management of master data. If you want an uh, obvious definition, um, but you'll see there is technology enabled, um, but it isn't a technology exercise. Yes, you need technology often, you don't always, but generally you need technology to uh, manage master data, but as importantly is the stewardship, the semantic 
consistency, the accountability, and the, and the business process around that. So when you talk with master data, and I, I feel that master data, like a lot of things, it's easiest to just explain by giving examples of it. And you know, whenever I do data modeling, that's the easiest way to describe a model. Give us an example of one, um, and then that sort of helps define the entity. Specifically, when I'm talking to you know executives or they're trying to understand it, they want to see some examples. And I thought it'd be interesting to kind of go through uh, ones we've seen day to day in our practice that maybe aren't the typical ones, right? Because the other part of these um, is that generally there is a business impact. And I either am a very interesting person or a difficult person to live with because you, we all have, we come home from work and there's that story from work, right? And obviously I'm working with, you know, Fortune 100 companies. I can't necessarily talk about the name of the company and what happened, right? Because there's client confidentiality. So I sort of have my little, you know, stories. There's, there's the cheese slice incident, right? That we all know and we can all understand because we've, we've talked about it. So how is a, a slice of cheese master data and why was it a million dollars? cheese slice? Well, this was a, a restaurant we worked with and had a big part of their business. When you think of it, when you're trying to describe a business, you basically describe a business by your master data. What do they have? Of course, customers and, and sites, et cetera, but they have recipes and they have, they have ingredients in that recipe and they have menus, all which have cheese involved in that. Uh, they have a supply chain that orders uh, the ingredients on that recipe. So long story short, um, cheese is, is a big part of their master data. Um, and be, again, because they had a very customized menu on their point of sale system, uh, customers were able to sort of um, add different ingredients that maybe weren't on the traditional menu. Well, this particular fancy cheese slice was much more expensive, but it has not been linked with the supply chain and everything else across uh, the business and it wasn't priced accordingly. Um, so a lot of people, because this was a very unique menu item, had ordered it and it actually lost the company over a million dollars across the year um, because that wasn't caught. So something as simple as a slice of cheese can have a big impact. And that, yes, that's ingredient master. That was menu master. That was supply chain component master. And the biggest issue uh, that they had was really getting that business process together. So yeah, cheese is master data. Another similar example was a $2 million baby bottle. And you go to wonder how can that all add up to $2 million? Well, this particular organization um, sold some of their products, one of which was a baby bottle online with Amazon. Um, and master data is very core to that. If we think master data, we often think of master data within an organization. It's also beyond an organization. The more we want to have shared data passed across um, and to, to sort of have your data on Amazon, you need that in a certain format. Well, this particular company, because their master data was not organized, they were fined by Amazon every time they had to do a change in the data. You know, something as simple, simple as, you know, baby bottle size, large, color, blue and green, uh, price X wasn't formatted accordingly. So there was fines that built up over time that actually were more than $2 million just because simple things like the size and cost and price and color of a, a product weren't quite right. So again, these things are all so simple yet so complex uh, because, because they're so common, they're touched by a lot of people. And often, and we'll talk more about that, it's the people in the process, not just the data that make these things break down. Uh, probably my favorite one is the dead fish over in the right. That's what I love about my job. It's always sort of interesting things. And I think I've talked about this one before. And I can use this uh, company name because they actually spoke with us. I think it was last year on Data Diversity, and that's all available on demand. It was the Environment Agency. And, and what's so interesting about Master Data, when you describe the Environment Agency, they're basically tracking living organisms uh, across the UK. So whether that's a cow or a fish or a you know, biological component or whether that's in the water or on sea or on land. Um, and really that's what we were trying to understand through master data is what is a living organism. And then someone sort of snarkily said, well, but the fish are dead. So wouldn't that be a dead organism? And of course I had to jump in and say, well, that was a living organism with a status of dead. <laughs> so it sort of got very Monty Python-ish. Um, but it was fun. Um, but again, that's a very different example of, yes, a living organism. And in that case, was their master data. That's core of what they're tracking at the Environment Agency is environmental organisms, whether that's a fish or a cow or um, a biological component. So that was a very different example. Maybe some more of the common ones. Another company we worked with um, was a major hospital. And so when you think of a hospital, what does a hospital have? Patients and um, providers and doctors. And, and a big part of the doctor was not only getting sort of the name and the address right, 
Um, but core to this was credentialing. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're glad that they do this. Uh, there, there's two Dr. Smiths, which one is credentialed to actually do my heart surgery. Uh, we don't get that wrong. <laughs> that would be terrible. Um, and that was tied to a lot of things, sort of a funny story there. Um, actually, the, the president of the hospital tried to get in with his badge, and after they sort of implemented this master data system, again, when you think of people in process, uh, the very well-meaning uh, office admin didn't let him into the building because he wasn't credentialed to do surgery, and it was the surgery department. Um, and he was quite upset, but I'm, I'm the president. She said, but you're not credentialed. And she was actually right, um, but it was sort of a funny story that everyone passed across. They were a bit maybe too strict on that, but I would rather have it that way than the opposite. Um, but when you think of the criticality of master data, yes, you can lose a million dollars on a cheese slice, or you can lose you know, a lot of money on someone dying, or a lot of life off someone dying. So often these have a big impact on very simple things like linking a credential to a doctor. Um, another story, again, when we think of customers, almost the most common master data that a lot of people talk about, so we have to have that in here. Um, but uh, uh, again, um, or David was talking earlier about you know analytics and, and graph databases and all the exciting things you can do with data nowadays, and you can. And this this example actually came from one of our financial services customers, um, where they managed uh, insurance for very high worth net high net worth individuals. You know, folks like us that have three different mansions and um, you know their their fine art and and several different corporations they own. And, and of course, they wanted to get that type of customer right and know as much as they could about them. So they had done all this great analytics across the web and scraping of data and seeing if there was lawsuits and seeing what companies they owned. And they had all that, um, which was exciting analytics. The problem was when they tried to match that with their own customer list, their master data wasn't good enough. So even though they, they couldn't tell which Michael Jones was the high net worth customer and which Michael Jones had just gone bankrupt um, and was just not a high worth net worth customer, and, and that actually prompted a whole master data management effort because even though they could do all of the sexy analytics, they didn't have their core data right. So I think that was a particularly great example. And they were a very, as you can imagine, large, well-established company. And even they, with such high stakes, didn't have a great sense of their master data. Because master, to be fair, master data is hard. There's just so many moving pieces, and that's the complexity to get that right. Another one that's common across a lot of different uh, re uh, regions, no pun intended, is um, you know, region or location or market or, you know, depending what you call it, location is another tough one. It could be a, a job site in a construction industry. It could be a store location. Um, in terms of the environment agency that spoke on data diversity, it was catchments and sort of how do you group these little different li living organisms and how do we, you know, look at the different environmental areas, et cetera, et cetera. It could be a market. What sort of market are we selling our products in? And they can often be complicated as well. Um, so all of this is complicated. And if it makes you feel any better at the status of perhaps your master data, I've seen, and again, names protected for the innocent, um, major Fortune 100 companies who have, and you probably have one of these in your organization, insert master data and insert name here. There was a major retail company that had the Mary spreadsheet that had all of their store locations in this spreadsheet. So imagine if Mary had left or the spreadsheet were deleted or you know anything to have happened. Um, that Mary spreadsheet contained that one of their most valuable assets, which was all of their different stores across the globe. Um, uh, probably a more extreme example, it was a, a utility that did a lot of acquisitions, and, and they're, in one of the cases, some of these smaller utilities in remote areas, their quote customer list was literally a physical notebook with paper and pencil um, written down. Um, and so trying to integrate that, and it's something to think of, and I'll, I'll use some examples of that. It's so nice to think of a nice, automated system where master data is merged through fuzzy logic and you can do all this analysis, but really think of the real world business process because that utility had all of that. They had a really advanced MDM system, but they still had a piece of paper <laughs> that they needed to integrate that had very valuable customer data. So no matter who you are, I'm sure that exists in every organization. There's the Mary spreadsheet or the literal notebook of pieces of paper or the you know, old access database underneath someone's desk, um, partly because these are valuable. Um, and I know I'm spending a long time on this one slide, um, but hopefully these stories sort of help resonate that you know, there's a lot of different types. Also think of the human factor. There was one large uh, corporation that they had a lot of trouble with the master data per customer. 
And when they looked at the reasons, it wasn't the technology. It was the sales folks were putting in their own cell phone number because they weren't going to let anyone else know the telephone number of their customer, right? <laughs> Think of the motivation behind that, right? They get commission off getting it. They're not going to share that with anyone. And so that was more of a governance issue than a technology issue. So I know we spent some time on that. Hopefully it was helpful, maybe entertaining and facetious, um, but hopefully give some examples of maybe master data you hadn't thought of maybe areas to think of, of are there gotchas in master data that aren't technology? I just kind of wanted to stress that. Another piece of master data, and we could have a whole webinar on just that, is the age-old question is what is master data and what is reference data? And um, I'll just say one person's master data could be another person's reference data. I mentioned location, um, and that's a classic one, that often is master data, the sites of your construction areas, your store locations, your catchments for an environmental area, et cetera, et cetera. Or it could be your old fashioned standard reference data. Um, I have a list of states and there's state codes. So go out and find the standard list of US states and they don't change very often and let's not overthink it. Um, but sometimes you have to, we're working with a media company right now, um, a market research company um, that is looking at country. And yes, there's standard ISO country codes, but there's also some political sensitivity of who defines what a country is that's often, you know, in some areas of the world disputed. So you can't always just, yes, there may be a list, um, but again, think of that usage for your organization. So it, it, it really does depend. There's no one final answer of what is reference data and what is master data. It really depends. Um, I'll use that example of uh, that we'll touch on uh, later was uh, flavor, right? So this was a market where we, I'll be talking with them this afternoon on this, actually. They may be on this call. Um, that uh, flavor for them is a major master data item because they're tracking flavors and trends across the globe. For a lot of organizations, a flavor is just an attribute on a table. It happens to be the flavor of something on the menu, right? I mean, again, it is so varied. You need to understand your organization and what is well, a good, a good uh, handle on that is just describe your company to somebody, pick out the nouns, and those are probably your master data. I sell products to customer in different sites around the globe. Those were three, right? Product, customer, site. So um, you, you could uh, analyze this too much, and I would just uh, caution you not to do that, right? So I, I couldn't help it as I was thinking of this. Um, sometimes when, if you follow me on Twitter, I, sometimes when I, ha I, my job can be so bizarre sometimes when you think of the things we argue about when it comes to data. And this was a true story, and I realized after I got off the call is I just spent an hour discussing what a mushroom was <laughs> with the customer. And for this particular company, it actually made a lot of sense. Was it a flavor? Was it a product? Was it an ingredient? Was it a pharmaceutical? Was it, you know, uh, what, what, was it a cartoon character uh, that's trending, right? So there actually was a business reason for us to be discussing mushroom for an hour. But you can realize someone who might have been walking in the room and wondering why data architects or quirky, that, that might have seemed odd. So yes, a lot of us on the call can discuss whether it's master data or reference data probably for hours, but please don't when you're talking to that business guy in the loader right um, who's just trying to get something done. And, and maybe it doesn't matter whether you call it master data or reference data, the most important thing is how are you managing it, is it correct, is it accurate, and do you have a data steward for it, et cetera. So yes, it's important to think about, but don't, don't be that weird architect that, you know, Gosh, those people are arguing, you know, what what a product is for the past seven days in the, in the conference room. Uh, yes, that's important, but don't get that reputation. So, uh, Ben, again, back to uh, this this framework. Always go with the business strategy. You know, what is the business reason for arguing this? Uh, I was doing a big project at a water company, and we, we architects can get our. Um, passionate, and I was arguing with someone. I said, "But why does this matter? Why are you?" Are he has stepped back, and he said, "You know what?" I don't know. There's no reason. Let's go on. <laughs> you can get so into the semantics, he kind of freezes. So I don't know. You're right. There's no reason for me to be arguing about this. So again, whether it's master data, whether it's reference data, think of the why um, as with anything. So another example, and we talked about customer, but that is the classic example. So we're trying to understand our customer to get that classic 360 degree view of our customer through our data. So as another example, we could be a sporting goods company, and we may have our kind of our ideal customer, Stefan Krauss, he's 31 years old, 
Um, he lives in Pontresina, Switzerland. He's a ski instructor. He works at St. Moritz. Like, this is great. He'd be our perfect customer. We want to know everything about him, what he's purchased, well, how he wants to be communicated with. Does he want a text message or a letter? How much, you know, et cetera. But when you look at it, he purchased about 500 euro of, of gear in 2015. Yeah, he, he looks good on paper, um, but, you know, he probably gets a lot of free gear because he is a ski instructor. Um, so maybe he isn't our best. But, but if you, you're trying to get a good sense of your master data and you're looking at the data, there's another Stefan Kraus, and he's 62. And if you just kind of looked at him on the surface, you wouldn't think for a sporting goods company. You know, he's a banker in Zurich. Um, he likes to watch football on the you know, European football on television. Uh, he wants all everything on a letter, and his secretary opens it with a letter opener. And, and he wouldn't think he's like our outdoor guy. You know, I probably wouldn't put him on the brochure. No offense, he's like a nice guy. Uh, but when you look at it, he actually spent, you know, 3,500 euro, um, a lot more, because he just buys the fanciest equipment he has when he goes hiking once a year in Rome, and, you know, he spent a lot of money. So you want to be able to understand that. So to be clear, and I want to make this clarification, this 360 view isn't master data. That's your analytics around master data. The master data is who's Stefan Kraus? Is he Stefan Kraus the banker who spends a lot of money with us? Or is he Stefan Kraus the ski instructor that's 31 and doesn't spend a thing, but he uses a lot of our equipment? Maybe we want him as a spokesperson, um, but maybe not. he's not our best customer. How do you do that? There's a bit of that putting all the pieces together. That is uh, the hard stuff. So a little bit more on kind of definitions, and, and this helped me when I was first learning about master data. And master data is one of those things that is so simple yet so complex. And it's a, if you're joining master data for the first time, it's probably a lot of the pieces of things you already know put together, like relational databases, like data quality, like matching rules, et cetera. But it's good to get your definitions right. So transaction data, that's more of your, your actions that someone bought some information. Your master data, or your core nouns, they're more static, your customer, your product location, et cetera. So if we want to look at this example, which is the retail transactions um, for this, this sporting goods company, um, you'll see that the, the transaction data is the fact that Stefan Kraus bought some Telemark ski boots on, in 2017, and so did Donna. Um, and those are the, the transactions. The master data are going to be the things that remain, that we have a product, and there's a telemark ski boot, but hey, the, the code is different. Is that, a, is that a typo, or is it because, well, one's in the U.S. in Boulder and one's in, in Switzerland, um, and maybe they have a different product code, et cetera. So there's certain things that are your nouns, and there's certain things that are your verbs and your actions. And one is transaction data, and one is master data. And they're very different, and you just don't want to mix those two up. So again, the transaction data here is going to be the actual purchases. The master data are the things that remain. So the fact that I have a customer and whether which Stefan Kraus was this. Was this the banker or was this the ski instructor? Do we have certain products? Are these the same products sold in Europe versus the U.S. with a different code? Is that a title? How do we price them? All of that. Just that uh, the locations. Now, even just when we think of metadata, is that the location where Donna lives in Boulder, Colorado, or is that the, the location where Donna bought that project product? What if daughter, daughter, Donna, I can say my own name, it's been quite a day, uh, is Donna visiting Stefan in St. Moritz and bought the product there, or does she live there, et cetera, et cetera? Um, is, here's a two-character field. Well, one is a state or region code, code CO is Colorado. One is a country code. A CH, which is Switzerland, right? I mean, that seems so simple, but that's a big difference. And you can see just a, a program could look, okay, that looks right. There's a two-character code. It validates against something, but it's a very different business meeting, and you don't want to mix those two up. One's a country and one's a state, very different things. So, again, hopefully that's a little bit of a primer there that kind of helps explain uh, some of these terms and, and hopefully why they make a difference. So how do we manage all of that? And there's many different ways, and we could argue whether it's distributed or centralized. I'm going to kind of talk about the centralized model. I think that makes a bit of sense. Um, but I, I will just start with, please don't put it in the spreadsheet, and please don't put it in the notebook with pencil and paper, <laughs> which I think is obvious, but you will still find that in your, in your organization. Um, so here is a classic view of it. And again, there's different flavors of this. But if we think of master data, one way of looking at master data is how do we get that, quote, golden record? How do we know that there's one Stefan Krauss 
and he's 31 years old, not 62, and he lives in Pontresina. He doesn't live in St. Moritz, right? How do we get that? Because the problem is there's CRM data. Maybe he talked to a salesperson and it's stored in your customer relationship management. Maybe he bought something in the store. Maybe he bought something online. Maybe we had marketed to him on the web. Uh, maybe he bought something and he's in the finance system. And we had to order and ship that to a special order through the supply chain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we want to report on that in the warehouse later, how many um, products were sold by country, uh, by product type, et cetera, which is different than master data. They are related, but different um, key distinction that a lot of folks get sort of wrong. And then you have your, your reference data, which again, we could, we could argue about, but they're kind of like the little brother or sister of of MDM. A lot of the, the core concepts are the same, uh, but again, that might be a state code versus a product code, whereas product would be your master data and maybe a state code might be your reference data that supports that master data. That makes sense. So why is that so hard? It, it could seem on the surface, um, you know, I, a lot of these master data problems are, are what I kind of turn into my little rants. Again, I'm, I'm fun at dinner parties, but you know, I tried to change my address for my insurance company and it's taken me three years. Why is that so hard? Well, because there are different systems and insurance, you know, the, your address changes the rate uh, and affects a different system. And, and so, but so many of these things that seem obvious, I mean, my credit card company, uh, they will rename nameless, but I've been complaining about them for about three years on data diversity that they don't realize that I have their credit card and I get a bill and in the same, the same mailing, I also get an ad to get their credit card. And so their marketing does not talk with their finance because I am a customer and they don't seem to realize that. So their master data for this particular company um, is not great. And that is why there's just different systems. The other complexity is that each of these systems has its own functionality and their own associated data model, which isn't wrong because they were built to do a thing, right? So marketing was built to do marketing and CRM was built to do CRM. Um, so uh, they might have your first name and your family name, and you're still lots of issues just with that. So the data architects and the data modelers in the call are probably twitching with excitement. This is where we live, right? Is it first name? Is it, is it family name? Is it surname? Is it last name? How many characters is that? That is all important, and that's what you can help rationalize in, in the golden record. But it, is, it mean the same thing? Is it stored the same way? And then which one is the right one, right? You might have three different names and how, and how do I do that matching? But so you need to understand that one of the first steps in master data is understanding what your source systems are. And again, this is a perfect, well, not even a perfect world, but a world <laughs> where everything is automated. And again, not that I've ever made a mistake on a consulting engagement, but had I ever, tongue in cheek, um, uh, we were ready to implement one of these and then we were sort of doing some last analysis and people say, okay, here, these are all the systems, but oh yeah, we don't actually use that marketing system. We actually use the spreadsheet over here to actually put the data in. And we had done a full CRUD matrix and all that. And we, we hadn't talked to all the stakeholders and there was an entirely missing system. So this may seem sort of boring and, and um, you know, repetitive, super important to just even understand where all of that source data is and what business processes touch them. So once you have a sense of that, the next um, piece of that is what, do you want your target model? What do you want that golden record to be? It isn't everything. I would generally say it is not everything. It's that golden subset of what is the most important cross-functional um, information. And this is a discussion and it should be governed and it should be a cross-functional. Where I also see MDM go wrong is that people didn't talk to everybody. Is this the right set? Um, do we all mean the same thing by family name or first name? Or you know, how do we want to store that? Get that right? Um, I was once tackled by a woman. I was holding a pen trying to uh, to uh, write this out, and it was so passive, she literally pushed me out of the way and sort of was wrong. I mean, this can be very, um, you know, political. And, and people, you want to make sure everybody's involved, and you want to make sure that this goal, it can evolve over time. You don't have to get it all right. So I would sort of say start with a subset and, and grow. It's hard enough to get the subset right. Um, but give a lot of thought to that as well. And, of course, the reference data that will go with that. Once you have that, that's where the MDM, especially if you're using a tool, can help with the matching rules to create this quote golden record, right? So, and I could spend all day on this one slide. Don't worry, I won't. Right. But so it could just be, what is the first name of this customer? Is it John? Is it Jack? Is it Jay? Is it John with two N's or one N? Et cetera, et cetera, right? Just getting the first name of this customer and what's the right one and should one of those be a nickname stored as a different field, et cetera. 
that's where these tools, especially with names, can help automate. You may need a data steward to look at that who might want to know and validate that. Um, what's the best, sometimes you can do it by, we always know that the CRM is the right source of truth because there's a business process around it, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But how you get to that golden record, again, could be an entire webcast on its own, um, but that is kind of the magic sauce that, A, your business process needs to be good to understand how that data is sourced, B, you need good data stewards and data governance that can help understand what this data means. And often you need a tool that can help with those matching and merge roles and, and really get a lot of that together. So that was the super fast, and I know I talk fast, um, version of MDM in a nutshell, and that's only a piece of it. But if we want to kind of drill into a little bit of a, how do you do some of this fancy matching, right? So a couple ways. Um, Sometimes you could, wouldn't it be perfect if everyone were born with a customer ID on their forehead and everyone could be matched that way? That's not how the world would be, and that sounds a little scary, actually. Um, but so it, it, you don't always have that nice, perfect key. So often you have to have an alternate key of, okay, could I match on date of birth and in the U.S. a social security number or social insurance number in Canada, et cetera, first name, last name. So that's a bit of an art and science as well. You don't want to overmatch. Um, and maybe lose some candidates or just have too many rules that slow things down. Um, so you don't overmatch, you don't want to undermatch and just say, okay, let's match on first name because I bet there's a lot of Johns in your company, right? So um, getting that right, how you get that right, some of this tech, you can do some data profiling, you can understand it. Often it's your data governance committee or your data stewards and data owners that can help understand the data. And this can be an evolution over time. Generally, I would say you may want to let me get this backwards in my head. You want to under you, you want to make sure you don't have too many resolutions that are not right. So you want to be a little looser in the beginning, right? Because you, you, again, if when you want to auto, automate this, you don't want to sort of overmatch people that are gonna he's gonna mess up your data later. So, and often you can have a human in the loop in early stages because you don't want to automate everything all at once. You want to have that kind of learning happen. And you can use technology for this, and there's fuzzy matching, which you can either code or a lot of the tools have some of this, and some of it's the obvious things that are easy to kind of automate is street, also ST with a period, and also street, or you can also put in common names. Um, it can kind of see things that are similar. Um, and again, that is something that you can, some can be, you know, I can auto approve if it's street with a period and street without a period. Yes, I can just have the machine do that. I don't think there's much, um, you know, uh, the, the idea of human to look at. But maybe Tim or Timothy or those common, you know, or is Main Street the same as um, Mainly Street or whatever. You, you may want to have some people look at it, especially as you start to train those rules um, and do that. But again, this doesn't have to be people looking at this, you know. I've been around a while, and I probably have horror stories of, of what goes wrong with master data. And again, none of this is brain surgery. It's, it's you know, it, it's not probably checking all of the boxes. And, and one of the things that have gone wrong in one company is they actually had fairly high-level business users, uh, actually even up to the VP level, looking through all of this data to see is Tim and Timothy the same person, and is Street and ST the same thing. Absolutely colossal waste of business users' time. And funnily, they never wanted to work with a data team again. So automate where you can and, and use your people wisely uh, because they're valuable and make sure that when you bring it, this human in the loop, um, they're, they're doing something that really is tricky that maybe you need to look. Yes. Hey, there's a John, there's two John Smiths at this household, one's 62 and one's 23. So either that's a typo with the birth date or it's a father son. Maybe it's an insurance company, we need to go to the agent and they can ask, right? Um, and that's something you don't want to get wrong because that's two customers or one customer and that's a relationship you really need to understand. So that might be a perfect example of having a human in the loop, um, but having a human in the loop, taking the period off of a street, rest T versus street, um, probably not a great use of people's time. So give that some thought, but don't over-automate, don't under-automate if that <laughs> helps. I know that's not as maybe as specific as it could be. Um, so... Um, once you have master data in this nice golden record, one of the nice things is applications can use that. So your classic, and you probably do this all the time in web lookup forms, right? I start to type in my name, it's an autofill. Or you go to the doctor's office, and instead of having 
I don't know. I, I have good doctors and back doctors. You go to the good doctor, and they can you know say, oh, do you still live in 101 Main Street? Yes, I do. Thank you. The 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 bad business process is you have to fill out that same form, often with pencil and paper, every single time you go into the doctor. That's not a great customer experience. So that lookup is really master data. That's the hey, do you still look at Main live at Main Street? Because you can look up at that nice kind of centralized golden record. Um, I, I mentioned that MDM is different from reporting, and it is, um, but if you have a good master data, that can feed your, your sort of dimensions in your model. So if you have good, you know, we're thinking of reporting sales by customer, by product, by location, all of those are your, often your master data areas that can be fed from your MDM hub. Um, so I, I want to stress that, and I can stress that again, because I think there's a lot of confusion in the market. And so, you know, Dave in the beginning was talking about all these great technologies that are great. There's graph databases and there's big data, and they are very different from MDM. They are enabled by MDM. So once you have a, a great golden record, you can do great reporting. You can do social network analytics, right? But, and, and, and you can do some of this without master data, but it's a lot better with master data. Am I linking to myself? Because, you know, I, I, I have too many Donna Burbanks, and, and I think I'm related to myself rather than I am myself. Um, again, one of the uh, biggest frustrations of any data scientist using a data lake is really trying to understand the data and having good quality data. So these, don't, these aren't mutually exclusive. You could have your MDM system feeding your data lake with a great list of customers and then do sentiment analysis off those customers. But if you don't know who your customers are in your master data, it's hard to do sentiment analysis and what they're saying, right? So they, they, it's not either or. Um, they absolutely augment each other, but they are different things. So don't get them confused. So um, I've mentioned this, but I want to stress this again. And this was again a, um, a Gartner report um, that talks about what I have been saying. So I I want to stress it, um, that yes, technology is important, technology is complicated in MDM, technology is only a piece of the puzzle. And when they looked, this is Gartner that looked at top reasons of failing for MDM systems, it was business failure to align with business process and not having the right data governance in place. And I would say that resonates with my practice of the hardest thing to get right. Um, and some of the success stories we've had, I don't want to make it sound all bad, generally, uh, when master data sings well, it's a huge success. Um, but the ones that are success generally started with a good governance group in place first and a good architecture in place. It's hard to build MDM on a shoddy foundation. So I wouldn't pick that. I wouldn't pick if you're just starting out into anything data to say, let's master all of our customers. They want as your first thing. You want to build some steps into that. And the steps are often architecture. Do you have data models? Do you understand the rules and the architecture? Do you have data governance? Do you know who the stewards are would be for all those systems? And do you understand the business process, how that data is populated? So again, what I find interesting, and, and I'm a semantic kind of person, when you talk about different rules uh, or different terms, what it means, often there's an entirely different group in the organization that does master data that's from the, the, the business in quotes, right? What does that even mean, right? But there's a, a business process around master data that's often very separate, ironically, from the technical master data team. Because the business people think, yeah, that's my master data. That is the, com mas the data that runs my, my company. Maybe it's an ERP system, and I have rules and processes around that, which is correct. Um, and then the, the data architecture team says, oh, MDM is the thing and the tool that match merge rules, and they are correct also, right? And so that's where the governance and the, and the collaboration really makes sense. You need all of those and make sure you don't. I, I've seen, and we've all seen it all, I've seen companies with three different customer MDM systems. I've seen customers with a, a business MDM and a technical MDM that don't talk. Um, and that's just, you can imagine, it's silly, right? So that's where getting the governance and getting people working together. So some tools that help with that. Big fan of business process. Doesn't have to be massive. Doesn't have to be um, you know, an entire enterprise version of all of your processes. It could be a simple swim lane diagram. So how does the data get into the system? Who touches it? How is it used? Uh, are, are we talking to all the people on, on all ends of that? Where it's used, how it's sourced. Um, another great tool that I'm a fan of, I think I've said this one before, it's a terrible name for a great tool, it's the good old CRUD matrix. Um, Druck, or we could kind of reuse those, switch the words around, because uh, it's a great tool and it's so simple, 
but so so valuable. And I often get you know questions of where to start with data governance. Well, a great way to start is look at all the different systems, get the data model for those systems. What are the key attributes that you want, or fields you want to track? And then let's just do a simple matrix like that. So for the product name, where who creates that product name? Where is it used? Where is it updated? So where is it read? Um, and just start doing that mapping uh, and get that right. And that's a very simple tool, but it's entirely valuable. And often where I see, it's old fashioned, it's been around forever, but it doesn't make it less valuable. And often where I see things go wrong, it's the simple thing, like I mentioned that one project went, went wrong, um, we'd forgotten the simple system that had updated the system or populated the system and we weren't aware of it. That's where things can break. Or a user that you didn't talk to, maybe they're just reading it, but they have an entirely different um, meaning of what product name is. And, and that is true. I, I, there's a marketing product name, there's an internal product name, there's a product code. I mean, any of these things, you will be amazed. It has a different definition with different groups. So that's where governance is, comes in, that you can talk to everybody and get their viewpoint. So when everything goes well, and I know this is complicated, but it doesn't have to be. There's different layers of it. Is there enterprise-wide, are we even prioritizing what the right business domains are? And I would I recommend, there's a lot of things to do. Don't do them all at once. Um, pick something and pick something, and maybe don't start with the biggest one. Maybe don't start with customers, the first thing you do. Maybe you pick something like site that might be a little easier. I'll get your your you know, processes and tools around that. Do you have a conceptual model that you even know what a site is? Have you defined that? What a customer is? Do we map that with our customer journey, our logistics? Do we understand the business process? Um, do we understand the overlap with other areas? And often, especially if you're a large company, how do we get, there's no one answer. Do we, do we do this with a particular region first? Do we want to do a slice of it at a, globally? I would say there's always the it depends, but I would say, Always do the conceptual model globally. You want to know, understand what customer means across the globe. You may roll out MDM in different regions, but the, you know, there's going to be different rules, right? Do we have the right ownership and both on the business side and the technical side? And then do we understand the logical rules, the match-merge criteria, the survivorship? There's a lot to getting that right, uh, the business process workflow. Um, and then, of course, the technical level, which is don't start there, right? Do we profile the data to know do we even have an email address? That's a part of it. Maybe we want to match on name and email address and phone number. And you might look at the data and say, well, that'd be nice, but we don't have any email addresses populated. So we can't. So all of these interact. You really need to do all three layers uh, to get this right and singing in the organization. Uh, so I do want to leave uh, time for questions because generally you guys are not shy crowd, which is great. Uh, but I wanted to leave you with a case study. Um, and this actually is, is the cheese incident case study uh, to kind of bring it back full circle. Um, so we worked with a uh, major restaurant chain, a fast casual restaurant chain here in the U.S. Um, and and the, what was interesting about this is we didn't know what this was, if that makes any sense. We came in, we just knew there was a problem, and marketing was the one uh, that sort of came to us with this. And got to love this. I find this a lot. And a lot of people across the organization that have data models and data flow diagrams without even knowing what they are, they had a whiteboard that showed their menu data and how it was populated. And they said, look at this whiteboard and fix it. Uh, and basically it was a data flow diagram that they couldn't get a great view of all the ingredients and products and prices on their menus, um, which kind of caused that cheese incident because someone had um, – had sort of ordered something on the point of sale system that wasn't priced right in supply chain uh, that was listed on the menu but didn't necessarily match what the chefs had created um, in the field. So, yes, this was a master data effort. We didn't know that up front. We went to the CEO to get this approved. As you can imagine, this was a fairly expensive effort. She had the same question all CEOs have. What the heck is master data and why do I care? Um, so we literally did a slide with a slice of cheese in the middle <laughs> that had all uh, the cost of that slice of cheese, the process around that slice of cheese, who owns that slice of cheese, and she got it. She said, great. And then her next question, the data said, what other master data should we be looking at? And I thought that was a wise question. Then we did supplier, and then we did a location, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of that was a business process um, model to really understand how everything fit together. So this was a great example where it was more of a business process issue 
um, then a data, the data was fairly simple itself. It was, you know, a slice of cheese and the slice, oh, there's a whole lot more to slices of cheese than I ever realized. There's whole databases out there of different types of cheese. Um, but that wasn't the main problem. It was more of the process around it. So I thought that was kind of a fun example that was interesting. So to summarize, um, MDM is hot. I think because more and more companies want to be data driven, more people want to do analytics. They want to do this great, you know, graph database and central media analysis and fraud detection and all the stuff uh, that was talked about in the beginning of the call. And then it breaks down when they realize, I don't even know who my customers are, or I don't have a list of sites, et cetera. It's, it's the dirty details behind everything to get it right. But when it is successful, it's super successful, and that really helps the company sing. To get it right, you need everything between the, the data, the process, and the governance. So uh, before I open it up to Shannon with the questions, just to remind you, if you felt we were light on governance, there's a whole topic next month on that. Um, just a quick plug, uh, we do this for a living, so if you need help with governance, you know where to find us. Um, and then I will pass it back to Shannon if we have questions from the group. Donna, thank you so much for another great presentation. Uh, as always, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and the recording of this session, so you will indeed get those. And if you have questions for Donna or David, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen in the Q&A section. So diving in here, um, among the business data, what belongs to master data and what does not belong to master data? Ah, that gets back to see. I knew that would be a debatable question um, that we should have talked about in the beginning of, yeah, there are, de depending on the organization, um, some is master data, some might be reference data, um, and these were some of the examples we showed. I think a core definition of master data would be it's used across the organization. It's critical to business uh, process and um, yeah, dependent on, it's fast changing, and that might be also where it's different from reference data, where, you know, maybe state codes, how often do we get a new state in the U.S., right? Not too often, um, but your customers change all the time. And a, and, and a quick way to do it, as I mentioned before, might be just be describe your company to somebody. You know, we have a clinic that supports, doc, you know, that has doctors that support patients across different regions, and there was three, right? We had doctors who are your providers and your patients and your locations, or you're selling products to, you know, customers. There's product and there's customer. So that's probably the easiest way to, to think about that. Um, and it's generally they're across different systems and then they're kind of highly used to drive the business, if that makes sense. Another slide we showed that kind of explained that was uh, this one that kind of talked about your transaction data and then from that what might be master data. So hopefully those helped. David, anything you want to weigh in on there? Hi there. No, I actually don't have anything to add to what Donna just said. All right. I love it. All right. So um, moving on to the next question then, given the way that you are explaining these examples, would you say that reference data is just a subset of master data, that hierarchy of regions, markets, locations, et cetera, seems more for the realm of RDM? No? Yeah, that, that could be, again, we could wax poetic, but I think, and in fact, that's almost how I threw it here, is that the reference data is kind of the little cousin of um, ma master data. I think, you know, part of it is uh, importance to the, well, I won't say importance to the business, because everything's important, but, you know, does it change very often? Are there often kind of, another way to think of it, often if there's kind of an external standard like ISO country codes or, you know, things like that, that's kind of codeless are commonly your reference data. I, again, you don't overgeneralize because you have product codes and that's your master data, but that's kind of a nice, I mean, it's almost what it says, it's the reference data, things that are ref, often referenced by master data, if that makes sense. Indeed, and David, I'll let you jump in whenever you're, you feel the need to add in, yeah, we'll <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then is it imperative to have a master reference data when implementing a master data management project? See, did I call it that I said in the beginning that we're all architects and we could talk for an hour on master and reference data? <laughs> um, so I would say, yeah, yes, in phases. I mean, don't stop doing master data if you don't have reference data. But if I go back to that uh, slide that I think I had, 
I mean, if you're trying to master customer here, and, and part of mastering customer is location, you need to have your right location codes. Is, do we have our country codes right? Do we have our state codes right? Um, et cetera. Or, we even, or you could even say metadata. How are we doing dates? Is it European dates? Is it U.S. dates? Et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, it's all, it's all related. Um, so it's, it's hard, hard to get good master data if you don't have reference data because generally your master data. God, we start, this is where we start to sound crazy when business people walk in the room, right? So be careful um, if, you're, if you're a technical person on the call. Um, it's hard to get your master data right if you don't have the associated reference data because generally a, a field in one of your re master data fields is a, I mean, referencing reference data. I don't feel like I said that eloquently, but I think you know what I mean. Works. I love it. Uh, you know, we've got just under a minute here, but let me see if I can slip in one more question. We've got so many great questions. Um, we're in need of mastering a uh, product that focuses on, on is on reference data. Does it make the sense? Uh, does it make sense to start with considering software as a solution uh, for reference data before mastering product? Um. I think you're doing this on Christmas, putting all the reference data calls. Uh, but maybe this just we talked too much. Um, I'm not sure. Are they saying they wanted a pro to do a, use a product to manage it? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, does it make sense to start um, considering software as a solution uh, for reference data before mastering quote unquote product? Uh, um, I, yeah, I, I suppose I, I would probably start with a master data. Well, because they're all related, I would say, what are we even trying to track with, with product? Understand the core fields, and then as part of your mastering of product, you want to make sure you want you know data quality is a part of this. So if you have really bad data quality, that's a part of master data. But it's not like you have to. Start, they're all related, right? So you can't say I'm not going to do my master data until I, the data quality is good. You're creating the data quality as part of mastering, if that makes sense. So I would see them as related because part of master data is even one of those core fields. So you could start that part. I mean, you may not start the full life cycle of mastering, which is the something I didn't talk enough about, perhaps, which is the publish and subscribe. You know, am I am I storing it? Am I mastering it? And am I pushing it back to systems to actually use live in the end? You're, you might want to hold off on that to your reference data is right. But the idea of understanding the source systems and where things are, because you might be referencing something that really doesn't even need to be a master data field if you're not really looking at it holistically. I think I rambled there as well, but hopefully, hopefully pieces of that might have been helpful. No, that's great. Well, Donna, thank you again so much. That does bring us to the top of the hour. And David, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and just again, a reminder to everybody, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording to all registrants. Um, and thank you so much for all our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I just love all the great questions in the chat that's been going on throughout. I hope uh, and you all have a great day and stay safe out there. Donna and David, thank you so much. And thanks to DataStacks for sponsoring. Thank you, Shannon. Thank, thank you, Donna. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.